Good afternoon. I'm Hugh Douglas-Smith. I run a web development company in the UK. Um, we now specialise in building websites on Joomla. And building websites where we put our own custom extensions in to for, perform particular business functions, business processes for our clients. An awful lot of those are involved in the e-commerce world. Um, we have a, a specialist working with us that concentrates on customer journey and uh, that's really the topic of what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. Why people buy, why they don't and what I will do is go through a live example of how not to do it and hopefully how to do it. Um, it's been great just following on from Crystal because with her talking about um, user experience, it leads very naturally into the customer journey of how people process through your website to end up at your desired end result. So if we're talking about e-commerce, let's um, start by just thinking about the difference between the online world and the traditional retail offline world. So in online, you can have very easy comparison of products. You can visit many, many stores from the, the comfort of your armchair. It's accessible 24-7. Uh, you're not constrained by opening hours. There's no traveling time. And you get access to many more companies and many more products. Potentially, there's better stock positions with warehouses supplying stock straight to you rather than a local retail agent. And it's very, very convenient. However, in the retail world, the big benefit there is trust. You can see who you're dealing with. You can see what you're buying. You can touch it and feel it before you make the purchasing decision. You've potentially got access to staff that can tell you more about the product, answer your questions um, before you decide to actually commit and buy. And then, typically, depending on what you're buying, it's instant delivery. You pick the product up, having paid for it, and you take it home. Good web experience has got to be appealing to the target audience. You need to know who it is that you're targeting, um, and then design the experience and design the site around that target audience making sure that the quality of design is good, the quality of imagery is good, and that all of the trust points are there. Um, making sure the site is mobile friendly, it, it sounds obvious, but it's amazing the number of sites that are only semi-mobile friendly. But it's a straightforward payment journey. You've got to make it easy for clients to be able to pick what they want, pay for it, and then process that order through to delivery. Um, you need to offer a very, very clear value proposition. You've got to make the online visitor believe that you can be trusted and you will actually deliver what it is your website is saying that it's going to deliver. And then guide them in where to go with very clear calls to actions. So who's your audience? This is going to very much depend on how you style, how you build your site. If you're dealing with business, if you're dealing with consumer, what's the age range, what's the, uh, the gender, are the services or products that you're selling supplied on a local basis, um, a regional basis, an international basis, and how will people access your site? Typically, if it's B2C, you're dealing with uh, consumer products, you're going to get a far higher mobile access um, point. If it's B2B, it's going to be more tablet to desktop. And if you're government local authority, particularly in the, the UK area, it's going to be old browsers and outdated technology. Your site needs to be visually appearing, uh, appealing. It, 
needs to reflect your brand and that needs to be consistent right the way across the site in terms of demonstrating and displaying products but also right the way through the checkout and the payment process. It needs to portray a quality, show that your organisation is a quality organisation that cares, that can be trusted. Um, but at the same time, without pretending to be someone that you're not. If you're only a very small organisation, don't pretend that you've got this enormous big office building and that's where you're delivering everything from because somebody's going to find you out. Images need to be very, very clear. High quality photography sells. It presents products really well. Um, it replaces the touch and feel of a traditional store. So it's worth spending time, it's worth spending money getting decent photography from different angles with good lighting for the, the product that you're selling. And work out for your audience what they require in terms of image size. Know whether they're going to be displaying it on a mobile, on a tablet, on a desktop and deliver the size that is most appropriate to them and to the products that you're displaying. Perhaps offer the ability to zoom in for larger images, but give the audience the choice to be able to do that. Don't force it on them. This is one of those situations where too small images is bad, too big images is bad. You've got to find the balance for your products and for uh, your audience. You then need to develop trust, and this is replacing that physical online retail experience, sorry, the, the physical in the shop retail experience where you can see what you're buying, you touch it, you feel it before you buy it. You've got to get over that online. Typically it takes six or seven touch points with somebody visiting a brand new website before they will actually trust you to start putting things into the basket. So reassure them, give them full contact details of where you're located, give them the confidence that you are actually a physical company that if something goes wrong, they can contact you. Don't hide behind non-geographic phone numbers, give them a number that they can say, oh, I recognise where that number is, it's in such and such a place, that's where this company is located. Provide reviews and testimonials, and don't do it only on your own website, but ensure that those are reflected through social media, so that there are more trust points pointing in to give you more credibility. Provide access to support. Allow people to ask questions. Make sure that those questions are answered, and potentially publish those questions and answers on the site to improve trust. It seems patently obvious, but make sure the, the payment process is totally secure. Um, there are still sites out there that aren't. And provide full upfront information. If you're going to be charging a delivery cost, make sure that that delivery cost is known prior to entering the checkout. Use design and content that will appeal to your audience and prevent them from saying, do you know what, I just don't like the look of this, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, you've got to delight your audience. Present images in an appealing way that entices them to want to go further. The longer they stay on the site, the more likely you're going to build trust the more likely they're actually going to finalise a purchase. Be mobile friendly and check that that mobile responsiveness goes right the way through the site. It's amazing when you get into a checkout on a site on a mobile and suddenly define that the, the basket is displayed, you've got all of your items displayed and the button to check out is off the right hand side of the screen and you've now got to start scrolling sideways to find it, it's another drop-off point. It's not obvious. Test the payment process on a mobile. 
is the return from payment back to the site still active? Does it still work? And then streamline the whole journey. Minimize the number of clicks that it takes for somebody to select what it is that they want to buy, put it into the basket, review the basket, provide their details, check out and pay. Think very carefully about the number of fields that you collect in the checkout. Only ask for what is necessary because every additional field that you add is a potential 20% drop off rate for anyone buying. In an average e-commerce world, a visitor will spend seven minutes on a website to make a decision, make a purchase and leave. If you're um, spending five minutes in the checkout, they've only got two minutes to browse. Then start to measure when the site's live where people are going. What routes are they taking through the site? Analyze where they're going, use Google Analytics and use A-B testing to work out what can I change if I change a button color, if I change a heading color, if I change the order of products, what entices more people to actually pick that product um, and purchase it. In A-B testing, the way to do that is change only one thing at a time. Half of your audience then gets version A, half of them gets version B, and over a period of 24, 48 hours, then decide which one of those two versions has succeeded the best, and then change the other one. And keep reiterating that process of always making changes to the worst performing, so that overall, your uh, conversion rate is moving up. When you're um, putting together a, a site, when you get into the product pages, you're wanting to entice people to buy your product. Give them plenty of choice, but don't overdo it. Um, and having allowed them to make that choice, then offer them additional products, additional services to upsell on the basket. But at the end, when they start to check out, stop offering them choices. Joomla is um, really powerful with the, the Joomla modules of being able to easily place extra little snippets of information all over the page around the main content. So in a, an e-commerce world, it's very easy using Joomla modules to pop up a module on the right that says, you know, this is our most popular product. These ones are on offer today. Um, these are the ones that other people have purchased because you're looking at this. But when you get into the checkout, make sure that you turn those modules off. Because in the checkout, all you want to do is to focus on, I need you now to pay. I don't want to distract you because potentially if I distract you and you go off and look at another product, you might not come back to the checkout. Make sure that your call to actions are very, very defined, very consistent right the way across the site um, and are guiding people where they want to go. In the, uh, the retail world, Ikea is a brilliant example of this. You go into an Ikea store anywhere in the world and you get lost in a maze where you're guided round. And once you've gone into the store, you physically can't get out until you've gone through that checkout. Even if you have to push your way through because you're not buying anything. Think of that as the way that you're guided through an e-commerce site. Be very, very clear about your costs. Don't hide them. There's a bit of a, a dilemma here because um, Google likes you to present VAT inclusive pricing. Um, businesses like you to present VAT exclusive pricing. 
it might be different in different countries, but I know this is the case in the UK. If you don't have, um, even if you're business to business, in the UK, you will get marked down in Google if you've got VAT exclusive pricing. So the way around that is you have a button on the screen that allows the visitor to turn on or turn off whether the prices are ink, VAT, or XVAT. Um, but by default, it's inclusive because that's what the Doom Spider will read. Explain delivery costs and options before getting to the checkout. And if you're selling services by subscription, explain what the renewal cancellation procedure is. When you get into the checkout, offer a guest checkout. Think about it, when you're purchasing something in the retail world, it's very rare that you get to the checkout and you have to fill out the form explaining who you are, what your address is, all of these other details, before you're actually allowed to buy your packet of crisps. Don't insist on a registration process in an online world. Always offer the alternative of a guest checkout. If your software is capable of doing it, track um, abandoned carts. If you've had people purchase before and they've registered, you now know who they are when they come back to the site. If they put stuff into your shopping cart, one of the great ways of turning them around is an hour after they have not checked out, send them an email. And the content of the email is something like, hello, I'm Hugh. I'm responsible for um, customer service on this site. I noticed that you visited our site today. You put a number of items into your shopping basket. Um, I also noticed that you didn't check out. I hope that wasn't a problem with our website. If there's any way that I can help you, please get in touch. Perhaps even offer a voucher randomly at the end of that email to entice them back. Don't get into the trap of always offering the voucher because if that becomes known, then you'll get lots and lots of abandoned carts until you've delivered the vouchers um, and people then come back to check out. Know who your customers are and treat them as customers that are valuable to you. Show them that they are valuable to you. And I always use the example here that Purchasing through Amazon once, the next time you go back to their website, they know everything about you. And although they're an enormous organization, the moment you go back to their website, they treat you as a personal individual and they focus everything towards you. You bought this book last month, other people have bought that, have also been interested in this, and it feels very personal. In the town that I used to live in, there was a little bookshop and privately owned bookshop and I would typically go and buy a book once a month for years upon years from them and uh, after five or six years they still didn't know who I was they didn't know what I was interested in it was the most impersonal thing and there was me supporting a local business I buy one book from Amazon and I've never been back to the local bookshop and it's all about how they treated me as a customer even though I was face to face so entice them back, create an incentive program. After people have ordered, 24 hours, 48 hours, maybe a week after if you're delivering something, go back to them with a mail shot, asking them do they want to review the product that they've bought? Are they satisfied with it? Would they be interested in X, Y, Z? Do they want to come back and purchase from you again? Offer them a voucher. But be really careful about how you put out coupons and vouchers. Don't make the silly mistakes. Don't give them vouchers that have expired. That happens. Um, don't offer them vouchers for the product they've just purchased, unless it's a consumable product that they're likely to be in the near future purchasing again. And personalize everything that you send to them. Make sure that throughout the site, particularly in the, in the checkout, 
um, pages are not too busy. You need to get information across in a clear, concise way that isn't going to just be so much um, aggression on their eyeballs that they want to go elsewhere. I've got an example here of what I consider to be and what a lot of people on the, the net consider to be one of the worst examples of e-commerce in terms of visual appearance. Actually, the company has made quite a thing out of this and they do it quite deliberately and it's one of their marketing traits. Doesn't work for me. Um, I would not buy a car from these people. Um, it tells me absolutely nothing about what they do. It's just abusive on my eyeballs. Um, then you're not the customer. I, I'm not their customer. No, you're absolutely right. But I, I haven't yet met anyone who is. So, um, you know, maybe it is just me, I don't know. But um, the, the next example I'm going to show you is the result of a piece of research that went on looking at the interaction of how users look at product pages and tracking their eye movements to see where they go. And it looked at two particular sites one of them selling bookcases and one of them selling flat screen TVs. And the really interesting thing here is that if you're selling bookcases, pictures and images are king. All of the eye movement is on the images. But if you're selling flat screen TVs, it's on the spec and the text. Nobody cares about the picture. So, it comes back to knowing what it is you're selling and who you're selling to, and then arranging your page to optimize what people are looking for. I'm now going to go through a, a case study. Um, my partner that um, is uh, heavily into customer experience and customer journeys came across this. Um, and she analyzed one of the websites that I'm going to show you and presented it. And uh, when I saw it, I was just like, wow, this is such a fantastic example of how to do um, e-commerce. How to really present a clean, friendly, concise, and efficient customer journey. And it was Cadbury's, that well-known maker of chocolate. When I went to their website, the bit I hadn't grasped, because I wasn't paying attention, was the URL to the website. So I went to cavalry.co.uk um, and discovered that it wasn't the site I was expecting to see at all. And it turns out that Cadbury's, um, in their infinite wisdom, have two websites in the UK. One of them is cavalry.co.uk, it's their corporate website, but it sells chocolate. They also have Cadbury's Gifts Direct.co.uk, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, I've no idea why they would use that. Um, that is a brilliant website, and it's really an excellent example of, of how to work. Why they didn't switch their URLs around, I have absolutely no idea. But if I was them, that's what I would be doing. So what I first did was go to Cadbury's.co.uk and I did this the weekend before Valentine's Day. Um, so it's quite a big time for buying chocolate online. And the first thing I noticed was that their secure certificate had expired the day before. And all I got on my browser was this frightening warning message saying, this is unsafe, you really don't want to go here. And a couple of days later, Sorry, let me come back to that. A couple of days later, they had um, reviewed that. They'd renewed the certificate, but they actually implemented it quite badly. So it still came up with a, a warning message. When you do get through to their homepage, this is what you'll see on the right, which is sort of dull and um, not very inviting. The contrast to that is their Cadbury's Gifts Direct, which just looks beautiful. It's nicely designed, it's appealing, it's got 
information in all the right places and it gives you everything that you need to know. So, a couple of days later, Capri's came back online with the extra warning. Um, but what they had done is on the left you've got the entire page, on the right is everything what we could say above the fold, so before you've started to, to scroll on a typical window. And actually, for a site that's trying to sell me chocolate, it hasn't told me anything. It's not giving me any actions to drive through. It's not trying to entice me to get to any particular uh, product that I can buy. When I finally find the product page, it takes me here. And on the left, you've got this enormously long page that shows the whole catalogue um, that I can't spell anyway, um, of um, products. But above the fold, all I get is this bit of writing, which is really dull and boring, and I can just see that they've launched their Easter products here, um, so I can start to scroll down to, to find something to buy. And I scroll down and I think, oh, mini eggs, I'll buy some mini eggs. So I click on the mini eggs and up they come and it tells me nothing about them. It doesn't even tell me the weight of what I'll be buying. It gives me a nice image of the package and they've greyed out the buy now button because at the beginning of February it's not Easter, therefore you can't buy Easter eggs from Capri's. You have to scroll three quarters of the way down their product page before you can find a product that they actually have for sale. In contrast, in Cadbury's Gifts, here's the, the start of the, the product page. Above the fold, they're giving me an enticing carousel that's winding around, trying to attract me with different offers. They've got a couple of products on the page, they're giving me information on the side to help me, and then they're upselling me in a couple of modules here, and clear actions allowing me to make a purchase without having to do any more than one click. So if we just go through this, this is also quite interesting. If you look at the, the top navigation, Typically in, in websites, your navigation, even in an e-commerce site, at the very top level is home, about us, our products, and our products then put us down into the catalogue of, of what we sell. It's much more effective to make all of that navigation second level and the top level to be the range of products that you're selling. So you're making it very easy for people to be able to actually navigate to what they want that is to buy. They've then got a quick filter, they've got help information, um, and the products and upselling the, the add-on services. They've used iconography brilliantly. So the modules that sit down the side of the page you're stuck, you need help, this is our delivery information, this is what it's going to cost, and why don't you sign up and join our newsletter? Um, but it's done through very easy to understand icons and some lovely images. <coughs> just makes it attractive. What they've then done is they've been very, very consistent across the site with all of their call to actions, and they're using a major action and a minor action so the major action is always this size of button with an add to basket. The minor action, much, much smaller and less prominent, is get more information. And that's consistent right the way through the site. They also change their module for searching. So as you start to drive into the site, their little finder window changes and becomes more specific, learning from what you've clicked on, which is very clever, enticing you to try and take more all the time. So having decided on a couple of options and gone into the, um, the basket, it's beautifully and very cleanly presented. 
It's telling me these are the products that I've selected. It's giving me, quite crucially, two options to get to the checkout. One at the top of the list, so that I can see it before I scroll, and one at the bottom of the list, so I haven't lost it if I have scrolled. And on those go to checkout buttons, it's telling me how I can pay, and it's giving me an option for checking out with Amazon. They haven't cluttered the screen with all of the extraneous information, but down the side, you've still got the delivery information help. Um, this is just viewing the basket, so we're not on the checkout yet. So at this point, they are still offering me other products to sell. But the moment I go into the checkout, those things down the left-hand side completely disappear. So I've now got my order summary here. It's telling me what's in my basket. And it's asking me, am I a new customer or am I returning? Um, and it's telling me across the, stop, the top how many steps there are, how easy is this going to be to check out. I get into the, the checkout process. It gives me options. Do I want to create an account or am I going to um, just be a guest checkout straight the way through? When we get into the delivery options, it's offering me three different prices for different types of delivery, but it's defaulting to the cheapest one. And that's quite key. Minimize the number of keystrokes that are required. So if you're offering two or three different services for delivery, make sure that one of them is selected by default and the best practice is choose the cheapest one. Having given all of that information, it presents the, the final order summary and asks me to jump into the, the payment process. And at that point, then, I can either pay direct or I can move off to PayPal and pay with them. Another example working in a very similar way, it's not quite as well designed, but it is very clear and very easy to use is, is ASOS, um, following very much the same principle of above the fold, the checkout, and below, giving me information on how I'm going to be able to pay, telling me what the, the benefits are, giving me help about how their terms and conditions work. So some final considerations. Um, think about the, the colours that you're using on the site and be consistent, match your brand across the whole site. Don't change colours and styles, particularly in the checkout, because it looks like you're going to another website, it looks like you're going somewhere else, um, and it will hurt trust and put people off. Use a consistent style for your um, buttons for your calls to actions. Different colours mean different things to different people. Now, if there's already an established brand, there's very little you can do about it. But if you've got a client that's new, um, doesn't have an established brand, it might be worth considering how some of these colours, sorry, how some of these colours relate to different emotions depending on what they're selling. And those colours are reflected through to gender. So if you're targeting male or you're targeting female in the products that you're selling, particularly on the actions, different colours will work better with different demographics. Again, it's worth A-B testing this to see what works best for your particular client. The colours of action buttons are also crucial in terms of certain colours will stand out and will work well. Again, it's A-B testing in your environment that's going to tell you um, what works best. One of the other big don'ts on a site is the immediate pop-up. You go onto the site, 
just start to read and bang into your face is a pop-up saying, can we help you, would you like to buy? Those sort of things can be very useful, but get them to be triggered by the, the visitor. Let them be in control of it. And make sure that having popped it up, there's a very easy way and a very obvious way of being able to get it to disappear. Um, don't put things on that are just tedious and seriously annoying. Proactive chat is a great way of improving trust on an online site, but it's only helpful if it's manned. There's lots of very clever software out there that will do interactive chat without a human ever being involved. Um, I would recommend even today with the very best systems that are out there, unless there's a human backup able to take over at some point, it'll do more damage than, than it solves. Um, the other annoying thing that a lot of um, e-commerce sites use when they put chat up is they make you go through a whole registration process, they capture too many details before you can use it. And it's just blockages that get in the way and the easiest way of solving that is go and buy somewhere else. So the drop-off rate tends to be very, very high. Think about in the checkout, unnecessary um, registration. And if you do have to have registration, offer the ability to sign in through trusted third parties, through Facebook, um, Google. Use somebody else that they've all, the customer's already trusted and allow a, a login through them. Limit the, the number of fields that you're collecting. Um, the less that you ask, potentially the, the more that um, people will buy. In the UK, and I'm principally talking about that, but it's relevant to other countries, when you're going for somebody's address, you need the address for delivery, but make it really easy for the address to be entered by using postcode lookup. Um, it used to be very expensive to do in the UK, it's now free um, or of minimal cost using things like getaddress.io, postcodes.io, um, and those interfaces are well worth the effort of programming because you can literally just put in a, a postcode and then select the address makes it very, very easy. The other um, ridiculous thing that an awful lot of checkouts insist on is you put your credit card number in and then it says, what sort of credit card was it? Well, you already know that because I've given you the number. The lookup on a credit card number to check that it's valid and to um, decide what type of card it is are standard algorithms that are very easy to implement. So why ask the unnecessary question of what sort of card is it? Because actually from the number you already know. I mentioned earlier default to the, the least expensive um, shipping method. Be upfront about charges. Um, the more surprises that you put in at the, the basket and the checkout level, um, the more drop off you're going to make um, make everything up front you're building trust you're not in the environment of um, people being able to actually stand in front of you see that you're there that you're a, a physical entity they're online make sure they can trust you use iconography where you can but where it's well designed and it's obvious um, and very, very intuitive. And craft the language to suit your customer base. A lot of um, e-commerce software is developed in the US and it comes across to Europe and in the UK. We do not understand the concept of cart. It's a basket, it's a shopping trolley. So change those language strings to make it appropriate to the market that you're in. And avoid blunt language. There's a, a great trend online to try, particularly in mobile, to make buttons fit. 
So you condense the number of characters, you condense the number of words, so your buy button becomes buy. But actually it's too blunt. And studies have shown that add to basket um, is a much softer, kinder way, and you get better response from that than saying buy or buy now, because it's too in your face. Different cultures will work differently, but I know from the UK that is a particular um, frustration that will cause people to, uh, to not buy. Use the right tone of voice. Know who your audience is and be polite. Speak their language. You are trying to gain trust with them. Don't be too forceful. Don't be condescending. What is condescending? Condescending is talking down. You're a child. I, you know. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that personally. But <laughs> it's okay, I'm very maybe bad. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's talking down to yes. somebody. You know, don't assume that you're the expert and they're the imbecile. Talk to them at their level and, and craft that in the, the language that you're using. I, I have said right the way through this, be very personal. But don't be personal before you've earned the right to, to do so. So in the home page and the, the sort of intro pages into the site, personalization, unless you know who it is because they've come back and there's a, a cookie that has identified them, is actually wrong. You need to be more impartial then um, and gradually you earn the right to be personal as they start to trust you. In product descriptions, um, there's a lot of debate on this, but the, uh, the general consensus now is let users decide how much information they want. So rather than putting reams and reams of product description, which is very, very useful, put in the headlines and then offer tabs to say this is the technical spec, this is the more in-depth description, this is additional images, um, and let the user decide what information they want. Make sure that you've provided enough that they can actually satisfy what they need, but don't bombard them with it all in one go. Um, users can be very anxious not to buy a product with the wrong features or the wrong quality. So think of it from their perspective and give them the trust that they are making the correct selection. If you get a customer that's anxious, they're not quite sure, their natural reaction is to click away, go back to Google, find somebody else that's selling it in a slightly better way and purchase from them. You've got to make them confident that the choice that they're making is the right one for them and that choice can then be delivered by you. Speed up the checkout. Um, this can be a really complex area depending on the e-commerce the e engine that you're using and how able you are to actually tune it or modify it to um, work in the most efficient way. Um, if you start with grabbing an email address, it's a necessary field because you're going to have to communicate with every purchaser. You can instantly spot with an Ajax call, have I seen this email address before? Do I know who you are? And if I do, then potentially, right, I've got your details, would you like to sign in? And this was a lovely example of you can't remember the password, rather than putting a forgot my password link where I have to go off to another page, it's email me a new password. So it's just twisting around what we normally see to make it really user friendly. Finally, always consider the customer first. Put yourself 
in the eyes of the customer, using your site um, in the way that you design it, in the way that you build it. And having built it, get other people that have no knowledge of it to go through and watch how they react to it. Once you've gone live, use A-B testing to up the conversion rate. Use Google Analytics to track the customer journey going through the site, um, measure, amend, and ultimately achieve. Thank you.